All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so much and that there is joy, Lord God, in your presence, in your house, and we thank you for that. And I just pray at this time, God, that um, you would have your way, truly that you would receive all glory. It will be your words that come out and that your life that really just sets in to the hearts of your people, that they will truly receive of your truth and to bear much fruit, Lord God, from this. So we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So obviously today I continue on in this spiritual warfare series. And as, you know, Pastor Shine and Pastor Elliot have already spoken, last week I talked a little bit uh, of just the enemy's schemes and how we combat that in spiritual warfare. So we said these, the word Satan literally means accuser, and we know Satan is a father of lies. And so how he works his lies is primarily, number one, through accusation, right? Primar and then so he accuses us, and then not only that, but he also does fear tactics, right? Because even give, trying to give us fear is his way of lying to us. Because one of the things that God has shown me over the years is the reason why the enemy uses fear tactics against us is because he himself is scared. He is fearful. And I kind of likened it with like a small dog, how they bark so much more than and often than large dogs do because they are scared. So then when they are scared, they bark to try to look aggressive and strong, but inside they are actually in fear. And that's kind of what the picture uh, uh, of Satan and his uh, minions look like, is they have a lot more bite that, or a lot, lot more bark uh, than bite in reality and we got to be able to see that and so today I'm going to talk uh, about walking out our identity and I'm not going to uh, talk so much about our identity okay because I'm going to talk simply about the power we have as sons and daughters of the living king when he told us that we are co-heirs with Christ and we are co-laborers with him he was not exaggerating anything like, it's not like we're just kind of pretending and like God's doing everything and like we're just nothing. He's like, no, I want you to be my co-laborers. And this is why Jesus, when he left the earth, before he left the earth, he told his disciples, I'm going to leave you, but it will be better for you because without me going, you will not have the Holy Spirit. But when he comes, he will remind you of the truth and he will, I mean, do all things so instead of us being like the 12 disciples who are with Jesus, all you're really doing is tagging along, right? And then you're just kind of, kind of looking at Jesus doing everything, right? But that's not what Jesus wanted. So then he sent them off two by two by two, right? The 72 and, and, and so forth. So that, and, and it says in the scriptures that he gave authority to them. And so when they actually started to activate their faith, they were so amazed and excited that they came back to Jesus and said, oh my goodness, even the demons flee at your name, you know, like I, before us and, and all of these things. And they got super excited. And that was just a preview of what Jesus desire for his believers not just to like hang out with him and ride in his coattails and let him do all the work but he wanted to co-labor with us partner together with us empower us and give us authority to actually do his work and so that is what I'm going to talk about and, and, and Deacon Esther mentioned the power of Jesus and I'm going to really focus in on having faith. So I'm not going to uh, um, talk so much about what our identity is in Christ, but I'm actually going to talk more about believing that identity and actually walking it out. So that's going to be the premise of my message, but I did want to kind of backtrack a little bit from last week to remind you a little bit. So uh, I, I share with you guys that verse um, in Hebrews 4.2, I pray that this will not be us, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And I'm going to talk about the primacy of faith to really believe our identity because if we do, then we walk it out. So I said claim our identity and walking in faith. Let's go to the next slide. And I wanted to bring a, a passage that I shared with you guys uh, from last week. And it talks about how 
right, this accusation, this indebtedness, how Jesus, he took away what condemned us. And notice in verse 15, it says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross so what we have to remember guys is that um, Satan has been disarmed no weapon against us shall prosper and I shared last week about how some people have a wrong picture of Satan they just say he's like an evil version of God but I was explaining hey I mean we know this he is a mere creature he is not omnipotent he is not omniscient he is not even omnipresent Okay, he's none of these things. And so Satan has been disarmed. Now let's go to the next slide. And then again, I shared this verse with you last week. But no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will be able to condemn those voices. Because they no longer hold true. And so Satan has been disarmed. All these accusations that we can actually condemn those accusers. And let's go to the next slide. And, our, and now we're talking about our spiritual weapons. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And again, this is something I wanted to contrast. Just as God and Satan are qualitatively completely different, that they're not like the good version versus evil, I want us to understand that our spiritual weapons are qualitatively different than the weapons of the enemy. So it's not like oh, we have these weapons and Satan has these other weapons and we're just kind of battling it out and let, like, let's see who wins. What I'm trying to tell you is our weapons are so much more powerful because the devil's weapons are a sham let me explain for example he is a father of lies well lies are lies they're not real and so when we replace it with the truth that truth will always triumph over the lie again it's a lot of bark but no bite it's the same thing against these accusations that we saw well his accusations are not real it's not true over us. We have the blood of Jesus. And so our justification speaks so much more powerfully than this. Same thing with fear. The enemy lies us through fear, but these fears are not real. And God reminds us that I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind or self-control. See, again, look, we have not inherited a spirit of fear we have inherited power and we have love and we have a sound mind where we could discern the lies of the enemy and combat that with the truth which is why the enemy left Jesus right in the desert because he kept on lying to him and trying to use things against him and Jesus would combat him with the truth and resist the enemy and he fled from us just like the Bible promises submit to God resist the enemy and he will flee from you he will flee now think about that word flight to flee means that he is scared that he really trembles that he I mean fleeing is like running away for your life and that is what the enemy does when we come into understanding and say yes and amen to who God declares who we are which is our true identity and actually walk it out and so <laughs> you know uh last week because it wasn't part of the message I actually uh um uh, prepared I, I, I kind of started on the story and I didn't finish and someone reminded me of that I actually re remember when I finished so so I'll, I'll tell you for the fairness and I sh share with you how um, uh, you know previewing that I mean the first time I actually had an encounter with demonic spirits openly um, was in a setting where I was kind of leading a group but I never done it and when it happened I remember thinking oh shoot like I wish there was someone else here but there isn't and they're looking at me as a leader and I don't know what to do and, and so I just went and I'm just like okay in Jesus name and, and and these enemy spirits got cast out and and my experience of that was I think kind of like what the disciples were like I was so overwhelmed with joy like oh my gosh 
Like, again, I, I know it's not my power, but I'm saying this power is in me. It, it has been access to me. Like I keep sharing, sometimes Christians always think in terms of hypotheticals that are not real, right? So don't focus on, oh, I'm nothing without God. We already know that. But again, we have God. And so what does that mean for us? What is the implication? Because that's the reality and not having God is actually a hypothetical. That's not real. And so in that same way, so that's kind of how it first came about. And then the more and more I engage in it, I realize that these enemy spirits are so scared of you. They are so terrified. Like they're really shaking. And so, you know, I, I, I get this, you know, and even to this day, of course, I, I never really get scared. Uh, but there, there was this one brother, a high school student who's like a big, strong guy. He started manifesting demons. And, and so we decided to take him to the back room. But I, you know, especially when they are like demonically charged, sometimes they're strong stronger than they are and so I needed like four strong dudes to grab each limb and take him to the back right and so I you know so he's lying down he's trying to get up and, and um, I look at him and you know I'm not scared at all right I'm just speaking and I'm speaking to the enemy and it's like hey reveal your name in Jesus name I command you and suddenly he he's like lying down pinned down and he just bring props up his head and it's like wrath and and, and uh, I mean that was the one time I was like oh my gosh like hey uh, guys you got each limb right because I mean I've had experiences where you know they bit me and you know they punch me and these kinds of things but I will tell you just on a practical level when they go berserk sometimes don't even respond to that just let sometimes they like that attention and so just leave them be or sometimes just tell them to shut up in Jesus name or to be still because one of the things that they like to do is they want to like you know bother the worship or or inside and get attention again because it's fear tactics because when it I mean it, it is kind of scary in the natural realm when you see someone like that and so that's one of the reasons why they actually do what they do but anyway <laughs> That was just to make sure that I did justice from last week. But again, remember, Satan has been disarmed. He is a defeated, vanquished foe. And so you, you know, it's part of being on the winning team. We know we are part of this. Again, sometimes wars, battles are not pleasant. And even in wars, sometimes you may actually feel like you've lost certain battles. But we always know by faith that we have victory. When Christ won that victory, it's not just talking about Him. It's talking about all of us. We are all participants in that. And we have to claim that. And so uh, let's go to the next slide. And again, I wanted to emphasize... The power that God promises us, He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, right? And one of the keys that we have to remember is this. Sometimes we wonder, why aren't we experiencing power in our Christian lives? Well, the purpose for which God gave us power was so that we could become witnesses. And so when we actually... Uh, and when we see signs and wonders happening, even in the scriptures, pretty much every time it was because they were testifying of Jesus. They were sharing the gospel and signs and wonders would follow. It usually wasn't the other way around. And so again, you shall receive power. That's his promise. We have power and this power is so much greater than the enemy's power that he who is in us is so much greater than the enemy who is in the world. And so again, let's go to the next slide. So do not underestimate the power of the weapons that God has given you. If he has given us power, then he has given us weapons and we come back to the armor of God passage, right? So... Last week I shared simply not to uh, 
complicate this message on spiritual warfare because when people think about that, they think like demon casting or how do I do this? How do we do this? And I'm not saying that has no place, but what I'm saying is that's very not important. How do you cast them out? You cast them out with the name of Jesus. There's no like step one, step two, step three. There may be certain helpful things things that come from experience but that's it and I talked about how there is power how we engage in spiritual warfare there is power in our praise I wish that every time we would come before the Lord whether it be on Fridays or Sundays that everyone who walks into the house of the Lord would tap into the power of praise or even just, you know, these are simple things. These are Christianese things for us to do. But there is immense power in these things. The power of thanksgiving in our hearts to thwart the enemy's attacks from allowing complaint to set in. The power of thanksgiving in our hearts to actually see everyday miracles where we become sensitive to the move of God. And when we recognize things that God is doing that you wouldn't have with a thankful heart. And so these are real weapons with great power and again I want to come back uh, to that passage finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the powers of this dark world again who have been disarmed and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms next slide please Next slide. Okay. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Or actually, let's go back. I, I don't know why. Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you, I, I missed that. You actually changed slides. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. It keeps telling us, stand, stand, stand firm. You will not stumble. So with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, again, last week I shared about the power of truth. Again, lies are sham. They're not real. Truth is powerful. And when we renew our minds with the truth, we are transformed. And the truth sets us free. With the breastplate of righteousness in place, today you and I stand in the grace of God and in the finished work of Christ. Amen. This is very important, again, for us to really receive and believe every single day, even if we screwed up, even if we fought with our spouses the day before, or whatever the case may be, that you and I today, by the blood of Jesus, we are fully accepted. Amen? Amen? That we are fully loved. Really, we are. We are fully favored. God does not, you know disperse him like like little by little like we are fully in him and we are guided by the holy spirit who lives inside of us and strengthens us that we are fully accepted loved cherished by god and that's what we stand on and so this righteousness of god right the breastplate of righteousness is so powerful especially against the enemy's lies of accusation because when we are fully aware of our righteousness, then we have confidence to wage war or confidence to walk with Christ. If we feel condemned, if we feel like God doesn't love us, if we, I mean, there's nothing we can ever do in the spiritual realm. We have to get rid of that unbelief first and allow the breastplates of righteousness to set in against the accusations of the enemy. Not only that, it says, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Once again, God has promised us a peace that surpasses all understanding. But not only that, it's a gospel of peace. And remember, you shall receive power when you become witnesses. And the gospel is powerful. Amen. In Romans 1 16, Apostle Paul tells us, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. The gospel is not just like a nice little thing about Jesus you say and hope somebody says yes or no, but the gospel is something that we live into each day. You know, I try to remind myself of that even as I am living with my family. I can raise my children legalistically or I could show them what the gospel looks like. 
And so there is power in this gospel truth in our everyday lives. And we got to tap into that and receive and believe in this. And then let's go to the next slide. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this faith, how this is the greatest thing, this is the most indispensable thing for us to have this shield of faith. Well, the faith obviously shields us from all enemy attacks. Because when we have faith in God, we're saying no to the enemy's lies. We believe in God and not the enemy. And then, of course, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Salvation, of course, from our gospel. Again, giving us that power, that joy that comes. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is an offensive weapon, okay, that we can use against the enemy to tear down his strongholds because the power, right, our weapons have power to tear down the strongholds of the enemy. And then, of course, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, particularly because prayer is a, a, an overflow of our faith before God. Again, these weapons are real and they are powerful. I mean, this is not so much a like, weapon in that sense, but even like a gift of tongue, right? I, to share with you a little bit of my own example, um, when I first received the gift of tongue, and it was kind of an arduous journey to get there, which I won't get into, but, you know, my tongue kind of have, has changed a little bit over the years. But when I first received it, um, it sounded so weird and very peculiar. Everyone knew if I was in the room praying. Oh, <laughs> there he is, you know, like. It, and, and so initially, like, I was like, oh, what is that? I mean, I don't even know what I'm saying. So, I, you know, and, and, and I wouldn't. So I kind of, it. It took so much for me to get it. I was so thrilled when I got it. But then it only took a couple of weeks before I'm like, oh, it's kind of weird. I'm just going to pray, you know. You can pray like that too. Um, but later on, I felt the Lord correcting me and rebuking me. And basically what he was saying was this, you know, who are you to judge the value of the gifts that I give you? That whatever gift I give you is because it's important and precious. And so I was like, oh, okay, my bad. So then I, I went on and, and, and shamelessly, anywhere I went, if I spoke in tongues, I didn't care. How, if People made fun of me about that, by the way. And, and it didn't bother me because I treasured God's gift. I treasured this power of God that he had granted me. And I don't know if any of you guys have experience uh, having your tongues interpreted. I really believe this is something that our ministry needs to pray into. But I have, and it's amazing. See, it's not translation, it's interpretation. Meaning, uh, you think you're saying the same thing because your tongue sounds the same, like over and over again, but you're actually saying different things. And so, like, it will be like, like you're confessing your love for God, and someone will be interpreting for you. And as you're speaking your tongue, you're kind of like, oh my gosh, like, I didn't know I love God that much. Like, it's an incredibly powerful thing. Again, the Holy Spirit, in, in Romans 8, it reminds us that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans, with wordless groans. And so He is interceding for us. It also says, because we know not what we ought to pray for. And so when we pray in tongue, we are praying for things that we're not even aware that we need, but, but we are in the Spirit of God. And so like Apostle Paul instructs in 1 Corinthians 14, how we should pray for those who have the gift of tongue is that we should pray with words and with tongue because that's what Apostle Paul says. He says, because if I pray in tongue, my mind is not fruitful. And some people can just get lazy with this. And so we should pray with our sincere words, but we absolutely should pray with tongues too. So then you're involving both your mind and the spirit language as well. And for those of us who don't have it, you should desire it because the scriptures tell us eagerly desire the spiritual gifts 
particularly it says the gift of prophecy because there is power in these things and particularly there is power in the name of Jesus the name of someone again it represented all of who they were and so it's kind of like you know you're not accustomed to that right when you think of warfare you think of guns or missiles or these things and you never invoke any you know you don't use your name but like there is power in the name of Jesus that is confessed and I'm going to get into that in a little bit so again coming back to why the devil uses fear tactics because he is so scared of us coming into full realization of what Christ has done for us and who he claims us to be so he is trying to lie to us and make us fearful to paralyze us from moving in our authority because when we start to walk in our God-given authority and identity he gets scared and so um and again, that's a part of all his lying uh, schemes. And I'll share with you a dream that I had some years back. And it was when I was a high school pastor. And I was, you know, I don't get too many prophetic dreams, but I get like one, I don't know, one or two or three a year kind of a thing. And this was one of them. And, and um, basically, it was this group of girls in our high school ministry and one of them came running to me and saying that they needed help. Like, you got to come right away, you know. And, and basically what, what it was, it was like this demonic spirit that looked like this huge monster. And, and I don't know, it's kind of almost like a, out of a comic book almost, right? And he was grasping those girls with this huge hand. And they were screaming for help and one of them was able to get out, get loose and she came running after me and told me to come because they needed help. So I start running with her to where this demonic monster is and as soon as I get there, I just jumped up and punched him in the face. You know, um, you know some of you guys know the Mike Tyson punch out. Yeah, the greatest Nintendo game of all time. And, and, and that little Mac, how he like uppercuts like, you know, uh, Mike Tyson. Like it was that punch. And then as soon as I punched him, the monster shrunk like a little tiny thing. And of course, ran away and everyone was safe. And at that moment, the spirit spoke to me. You need to train these girls to learn to be warriors for Christ. And so some of them, I would dare to say, are very strong young women in Christ beyond that age. But again, what I'm trying to relate to you is all of us have this access. It's not like, oh, Pastor Shine's up here and like, I'll never get to that place or anything. All of us have the same Spirit of God and you know how much authority there is in being the sons and daughters of the king of kings and the lord of lords of all right every great king every great emperor whether it's julius caesar or genghis khan or alexander the great all of them will bow before the king of kings and the lord of lords right there is power and we are his sons and daughters and and we can never say that when we are his sons and daughters that we don't have power right if he is king I always liken it to this you know I I don't know why it's not the best example but but I I, I liken it to this I you know the North Korean dictator right Kim Jong-un um I always I say it like this I, I know he's like a few years younger than me but like I say imagine if he was my classmate right while his dad was still alive and he decided just because he was being a jerk he decided to slap me in the face or spit at my face what would I do I would just pretend like nothing happened and some guys are like oh you're chicken like oh you should you can't let a guy just like well you want to be killed like I mean really right I mean you would be stupid to retaliate like that's one guy I'm not going to retaliate because I know who his dad is. Are you kidding me? I don't want to get sent to a labor camp or, I don't know, get tortured or something, right? And so in that sense, 
Jesus tells us very clearly that he has given us authority to cast out spirits, to heal the sick, and to raise the dead. And he wasn't talking to super Christians, right? Just as it says in James 5, Elijah was a man just like us. But when he prayed, God shut up the heavens for three and a half years from rain coming down. Elijah was just a man like us. He wasn't anything special. We look at the Mount Karma and you're like, oh my gosh, he's so great. But what, what happened afterwards? When he confronted King Ahab and they wanted to kill him, he was becoming suicidal. And he was as depressed and, and, and as discouraged as anyone could get. He was a mere man. You know, God has used me to cast out spirits or heal the sick. And I, I don't say this in any kind of a, this is special way, but he's never used me to raise the dead. But I believe not only that God can, but God will use me to raise the dead. Again, I'm not speaking like just out of hypotheticals. I'm not saying it because I'm stupid and I believe in that stuff. Of course I believe in that stuff because that is the power of God's word. Of course, before God, who is the resurrection and the life, why can't the dead be raised? And I believe and I trust that God will use me for that because that's what I want to see. Not again for my glory, but I want to see radical faith. I don't want to just live out a Christian life like going to church and doing some nice things, but like I want to see and experience with my own eyes every promise that God has made to his disciples. And he told us specifically, I, will give, I have given you that authority to do so. So why not me? Why not you? It's not anyone special. It's simply someone who has faith, right? Because whatever we ask in His name, He said He will give to us. And He says in Mark 9, 23, that all things are possible to those who believe. Let's go to the next slide. And I want to focus on this because sometimes Christians have a wrong conception of what sin is. A lot of times, we just think like the rest of the world does. Like sin is like doing something bad, right? Like murdering somebody or like committing adultery or like stealing something. And of course, those things are sin. But what we have to get at is the root of it all. And so when we do these things, we know implicitly as Christians, oh my gosh, you shouldn't do those things. Those are so bad. But then when we doubt God, when we have unbelief, we just think, oh, that's just normal human stuff. But what God makes very clear is faith is really everything and unbelief is a terrible, terrible sin. He makes it very clear. I, I mean, I had like seven, eight verses, but I, I chose not to put all of them. But in Hebrews 6, 12 and verse 19, he's talking about the Israelites, right, in verse 19. But see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So we see that these Israelites were not able to enter the promised land because of their unbelief. Though you already know all this, Jude 5 says, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroy those who did not believe when God was talking to Moses and he was so just frustrated by the Israelites he says how long will these people anger me how long do I have to put up with their unbelief let's go to the next slide and the reason why unbelief is bad is because we're making God out to be a liar our unbelief is an accusation against God that we are right and God is wrong. But that's a big thing because we know Satan is a father of lies. And in the scriptures it says it is impossible for God to lie. And we're accusing him of that. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts his testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar. Because they have not believed in the testimony God has given about his Son. And it's not just coming to sal salvific faith, but again, in our everyday Christian lives. We must believe. Everything is possible for those who believe. Unbelief is a great sin in the eyes of God. We're not just talking about simple worldly morality, but when we are walking with God and believing in His name, our unbelief is a severe thing that 
incapacitates us. And again, that's something that God is displeased with. That's why in Hebrews 11, 6, it says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Now, take a look. Go to the next slide. And this is what Jesus says about his work. John 6, 28, 29. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. It's that simple. Again, it's not just intellectual head knowledge. We get that. But it's simply to believe and to live out that faith, to live out that belief. So again, I hope I made it very clear, the gravity of unbelief. Because the reason why I talk about this is a lot of times the reason why people do not walk out their identity is because of their unbelief. It's like, oh no, God can't love me. Or like, oh yeah, yeah I know God can use Pastor Shine, but like me, like I'm, I'm, I'm like such a baby still. And, and like we, with the lies of the enemy, we disqualify ourselves from being used in God's kingdom. Because again, your focus is wrong. You keep on looking at your own weaknesses when God tells us to trust in Him, have faith in Him, right? That's why Apostle Paul says, I did not come with you with elegant words, eloquent words, but in the power, right? But demonstration of the Spirit's power, and then 1 Corinthians 2, 4 goes on to say, so that you... Your faith will not rest in man's eloquence, but that you will have faith in the power of God. And so in that same way, we are simply called to believe. Let's go to the next slide. All things are possible. And this ties in with the whole fear thing. Why are you fearful, oh, you of little faith? Well, why? Because you have little faith. Faith removes that fear. Go to the next slide. And this is, of course, Jesus' great promise. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then he repeats himself, you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, I remember this was always one of the hardest verses for me to really believe in. Verse 12, Jesus says, you know what? You're going to do my works, what I've been doing. And you're going to even do greater things. And I'd read that and go, yeah, right, Jesus. Like, you mean you raised Lazarus? And like, yeah, what's better than that? Like, I, I can't even sniff that. And... Part of what God was revealing to me, of course, notice how he reveals a reason because he is going to the Father. And so it's not like, of course, my strength or my power, but part of a father's heart, every dad and every mom, I believe, wants their children to be better than them. It's just how we are, right? And so in that same sense, I mean, God's power is unlimited. So he can do whatever he wants. And he actually receives glory and great delight when we co-labor with Jesus and he, through us, does incredible things. And I dare say there are people who are walking in that faith, who have done incredible things, reached more for Christ than Jesus did in his earthly ministry raised more dead people than Jesus did in his earthly ministry. But again, God gets the glory. And I pray that you and I will allow his word to speak and take root in our hearts so that we will hang on to that belief. Because God is true. He is, he, it's impossible by God's nature for him to lie. And then he goes on, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. Again, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So God is greatly delighted. He is greatly glorified when we ask in His name and He gives it to us and He repeats Himself just in case He didn't make Himself clearer in verse 14. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Again, there is such power in the name of Jesus. Again, I mean... 
Think about this first. You can ask anything in His name, and He will do it. This is a right, the birthright of sons and daughters. This is a privilege of those who belong to Christ. And this is an incredible power that we can ask anything in His name and He will do it. So we can move the mountains. Let's go to the next slide. Through you we will push back our adversaries. Through your name we will trample down those who rise up against us. Again, the power of the name of Jesus. And let me wrap things up. Go to the next slide. And this is God's promises. This is the last slide, right? Yeah. Our authority and our promised victory in Him. And again, I pray that we will simply receive it with childlike faith. I have given you authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. You know, I was reminded of this verse because obviously I prepared it when Pastor Shan was even sharing about the Guatemala story and how Deacon Bobby saw the shark. It's like, you know what? You know, I'm not saying that Christians can never be victims to natural disaster, but as long as we're in the Lord's will, as long as we're doing His work, I absolutely believe that we are protected in His name. That's why we saw Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, right, getting bitten by a snake and nothing happened to him. You know, I, I know there are certain Christian <laughs> groups that, you know, do snake stuff uh, every Sunday and, you know, sometimes these pastors die and so forth. Um, it's probably not a good idea to, like, okay, all oh, that verse, so we should on every Sunday just uh, do these snake tricks. Like, I mean, that's not the point, right? Again, the point is to be witnesses of God. When Apostle Paul was bitten by that snake, but nothing happened to him, those crew members who were taking these prisoners, they came to the Lord. But we got to believe, again, that this is very much possible, that a scorpion may sting you, a, a shark may attack you, or whatever the case may be, but God is greater and His name protects us. And then lastly, of course, a simple verse, but thanks be to God, just a simple point blank, who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus has victory, you have it too. It doesn't work the other way around. If he has authority, we have it too. Because Jesus said, all authority in he heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So the great commission was prefaced by Jesus simply saying, hey, I have every authority in heaven and on earth. And he's saying, now go. Why? Because now he releases that authority to us. And so there is power in being sons and daughters of the living God, the King of kings, Lord of lords. And I know we know this in our heads, but I pray that we will say yes and amen in our hearts and believe our identity. No matter all your flaws, no matter all your screw-ups, no matter all of those self-condemning voices, that I pray that the blood of Jesus will have the final word and who God declares us will be true because again we will be able to condemn those voices that accuse us because of what Christ has done and to come into alignment by faith with the authority that God has given us and to start to move in it you know I, I, I was so blessed by Heidi Baker uh, in one of her books she, she shares this testimony because God spoke to her that he was giving her the gift of healing and so she started praying for people and she said, the first 100 people she prayed for did not get healed whatsoever. But starting with 100 first, she started to see miracles. She literally saw five loaves and two fish miracle because in Pemba, Mozambique, where she has these orphanages, they were so lacking in food. You know, that's all they had literally. And they, she had all these orphans. And she simply pray to God, God, I need to feed these kids. So please help. And literally, she started breaking bread and she kept on breaking bread until everyone had plenty to eat. Now, I don't believe this because I'm some, you know, naive little dumb child. 
But because I choose to believe, I, I know who I believe in, and God is more than able to do anything <laughs> that our minds can fathom. That's why I believe that testimony. And I'm, I, I got so blessed by it because I remember when, when I started praying for people's healing, I didn't see anything. I, I think I probably quit on like the fourth or fifth one. It's like, oh God, like, oh, what if I pray but they don't get healed? That's not going to be good for your name. But then when I read that testimony, I was like, you know what? What have I got to lose? Maybe if they don't get healed, maybe they don't think I'm anointed, but who the heck cares? It's not about me. All I know is that if I don't pray, I won't see anything happen, but if I do, and I just started doing it, and I would get discouraged, but I would remind myself of Heidi Baker. I thought, wow, this woman has great faith. Like, 100 first? I'm like, 100 times you failed and you kept on going? Like, again, I would have quit on the fifth one, but, um, but when... You keep doing it and exercise that faith. I started to see, oh my gosh, people are getting healed. Oh my gosh, things are happening. And it's me, again, coming into alignment and believing in what God said, that he has given me authority to heal disease and to actually exercise it. And I pray that every single one of us no matter if you became a Christian a couple of months ago or you've been a Christian for 50 years, whether you're a pastor or a deacon or just a lay member, I mean, whatever, you know, our age or whatever it may be, that all of us will say yes and amen to what God declares us to be and to take hold of the authority and power that we have in the name of Jesus and to actually start to walk it out and live it out. Because surely... We have victory in this spiritual warfare. And surely God has given us powerful weapons to engage in spiritual warfare against the enemy's sham of weapons that he tries to trump up into something that it really isn't. Let me ask the praise team to come. The first uh, prayer that I want us to lead us to, and, and, and again, we're just going to have a time of prayer and praise, because both are good and powerful and great. So, um, but um, uh, as a praise team uh, comes up and, and, and leads us together, but uh, the first prayer that I'd like us to uh, pray is um, thanking God for loving us completely for accepting us fully for giving us his complete favor and just we are the righteousness of God in Christ that we are perfect in him because we've been uh, robed in his righteousness and Jesus's righteousness has been imputed to us meaning you and I are just as righteous as Jesus is. That is the awesome power of Jesus. And I pray that you will receive that, accept that, and give thanks to God for that. So let's come in alignment with what God has done and declares has happened in each and every single one of us and give Him thanks and praise for it, shall we? Let's pray together. God, we come before you today and Lord, we trust in you. We have faith in your words, God, because your words are true. And Lord, we thank you that despite all of our sins, that you have obliterated all of it so that you remember those sins no more. Lord God, not only that you have forgiven us, but you have forgotten those sins because they no longer exist. And we thank you for the power of the blood. And I pray, Lord God, that you will truly, Lord, help every single person here accept your words of truth, the power of your blood over us, where we are the righteousness of God, that we are as righteous as you were, Jesus, because that is what you have given us. So, Father, I pray that you will truly, Lord God, allow our hearts to come into alignment, that we are fully accepted, all of us, that we are fully loved, that we have your favor 
that we are anointed by you and that we you receive us Lord God without reservation right now I pray and break up all self-condemnation voices surely when we stand with Christ we will rebuke and condemn those voices that accuse us so Lord I pray against any self-doubt or self uh, uh, hatred or or any of those things right now I break that off in the name of Jesus we thank you Jesus for what you have done we praise you God blessed be your name we thank you that we have all spiritual blessings in you Lord Jesus and that we are loved without limit and we have joy evermore and that we have promise upon promise of hope in you God and we thank you that you have granted us peace that transcends all understanding we thank you Lord Jesus for who you are and what you have done and who you declare us to be so we thank you Lord Jesus